I'm a senior economist and primarily work on AI policy and its intersection with national security, uh, government, and the economy. Um, today, we're happy to, I mean, this whole event is called AI and National Security. This, this is the uh, ultimate panel, goes by the same name. So um, hopefully we'll break new ground and not retread the same ground. But uh, to my left, we have uh, Jeff Elscott, who wears many hats, but, uh, including being an information scientist at RAND, but he primarily uh, is here as the director of the Center for uh, Technology and Security Policy. Um, and to his left is Joe Chapa, uh, who is a liaison for the Department of Air Force uh, as a for, for the Air Force as a Chief Responsible AI Ethics Officer. Um, then we have Mark Beal, who is the CEO and founder of Gladstone AI, and in the near future will be uh, pulling back from that role to work on policy more directly. And then finally, we have Tiffany O'Brien, uh, who is VP of AI, AL, AI and, and Machine Learning uh, Acceleration at, at, at Lidos. Uh, so to kick us off, I think it'd be worthwhile to have everyone just give a, a three to five minute sort of synopsis of how you see the intersection of generative AI and national security. Um, is that even the right framework that we should be talking about? And what are the big um, big things that stick out to you? So we'll start with you, Chad. Sure, so as Sam said, I lead a center at RAND called uh, the Center for Technology and Security Policy, where we focus on technology competition and tech risks, which basically boils down to beat China and don't die. Uh, and for, for us, we spend a lot of our time thinking about dual use technologies like AI or biotech or, or so on. And one of the difficulties with AI is that AI as a category is quite broad, overly broad. And if you are trying to think about uh, competition or uh, regulation governance or any other thing, it can be really difficult to put into a single bucket both you know, facial recognition and self-driving cars and chat GBT and so on when what they actually do is so dissimilar or um, how they are built can have more similarities, but still uh, a lot of diversity. So in general, I think there's a lot of utility of necking down whatever your analyses are, be that in uh, competition or governance on uh, the particular kind of AI that you're talking about. I think from a uh, perspective of national security that uh, both of these issues of competition and risks are critical. Uh, that if the U.S. sort of uh, uh, kills the golden goose uh, in terms of our technological competition and innovativeness of our society, then that is going to really hurt our national security. Maybe not on uh, this week, but over the course of the coming decades as we would sort of uh, lose ground to our primary competitor, China. Um, but I think that there are also risks that arise from these uh, frontier technologies, either in ways that they could be destabilizing in a military context, we heard of some of that earlier today, um, or ways that they could uh, create new categories of risk from non-state actors and, and so on. So I do think that there is uh, plenty of things that actually matter in, in this space, but that uh, identifying what particular threads or verticals you're going for is very helpful. Joe Chatter. Great, thank you. Uh, as you heard, I'm an Air Force officer. The views I express today are my own and don't necessarily reflect anybody else. Um, I'm going to say two things here in these brief opening remarks. The first one planned, the second one somewhat unplanned. Uh, so on generative AI and national security, um, one of the things that's very important in this moment that we're all sort of living through is that the relationship between the government and industry is very, very different from what it was in previous generations of technological development. Right. So if you think back to during the Cold War, you can imagine that as an environment of strategic competition. I think that was very real. That was an environment in which technology really mattered to the government and in national security, that, that we have in common, right? But at that time, a lot of the technologies that were relevant to, say, the Defense Department were being funded primarily by the Defense Department. And so the, the DOD kind of had, it, had its, its, uh, its hand on the, on the rudder steering the ship of how we're going to develop militarily relevant technologies. That's very, very different from the environment in which we find ourselves today in which the, the, um, the leaps and bounds that we're seeing in AI and now more recently in generative AI are taking place in industry almost entirely independently of the Department of Defense. And so one of the things we have to learn internally is how do we become a fast follower uh, in such a way that we can adopt the technology that's rapidly becoming available, we can build the right relationships with industry so that that adoption is a little more smooth, and crucially, we can ensure that our workforce is as educated and trained on current technology as possible. Um, I think I'll say more about that throughout the panel discussion. The thing I wanted to say that is somewhat unplanned um, is we heard a lot about human in the loop today, and I would just like to throw a wrench. Um, I wanna emphasize 
that the views I express are my own and don't necessarily reflect the government. Um, nowhere in DOD guidance are you gonna see the phrase uh, human in the loop. That is, that's not a policy that the DOD holds. And I think there are real good reasons for that. One reason I think for that um, absence of that, that language and policy is that if we're gonna talk about a human in the loop, we need to be really specific about which loop we're referring to. Um, so just to give you an off, off the cuff example, in 1991, General Schwarzkopf gave what was then called the mother of all briefings, right? He had the charts and he stood up at the podium. And he said in that briefing that his operational objective was to reduce the warfighting capacity of the armored force, the Iraqi armored force by 50%. That's a human decision. General Schwarzkopf says we're gonna reduce the warfighting capability of the tanks by 50%. What if, in 1991, Schwarzkopf had lethal autonomous weapon systems that could go blow up those tanks? I think most people would want to say, wait a second, we need to make sure there's a human in the loop, right? But if we don't carefully define what loop we're talking about, I could respond by saying we do have a human in the loop. It's Schwarzkopf. He said, go deplete the enemy's ability to fight with the tanks by 50%, right? And so if you, you don't have to look very far to find technologies we've had for a long time that really kind of are on that blurry line of, is this a human in the loop system or not, right? Uh, uh, systems like the advanced medium range air to air missile that we've had for 30 years, pilot releases it and it goes to a volume of space and then finds a target, right? So I, I want to express to you that, um, that that term is less helpful than we think it is unless we define what the loop is. I'm happy to say more about that in the Q&A. Uh, hopefully that tees up some thoughts. All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Mark Beal. Um, as was mentioned, I, as of Sunday, I was the CEO of Gladstone AI. Um, our company had done a lot of uh, foundational educational products for U.S. government customers so they can help, you know, potentially even create information parity with those out there in the tech sector making all the big important decisions. Um, we were also the first company to deploy a large language model application to the U.S. government, to the Air Force. And this is well in advance of ChatGPT. Um, and we've, we've been doing some work with another government agency around consulting about what sort of the options are available to policymakers pursuant to governance in the context of advanced AI systems and national security. So I've stepped down from that role to focus on how taking this policy and trying to implement it in very real ways. Uh, I'm just going to start by saying the United States today faces perhaps its greatest test of technology governance in history. And I will say, hopefully unsurprisingly, that we are failing, full stop. Um, I, I, I think um, I used to work for Secretary Mattis. And I was his Iran policy guy. And he was a really tough boss. And he would say things like, to find a problem, to a Jesuit's level of satisfaction. I think it's nice, this is a Catholic university. And, but when you define a problem to the Jesuit's level of satisfaction, what that does is it makes the solution space a little less murky and a little more clear. So to echo the colleague, uh, my colleague, Dr. Alstott here, you hear folks talking today about a whole range of different types of AI risks. Um, everything from if you put CEO in an image search in Google, you get faces of white males, uh, not, not, not a representative sample of, of the population, all the way up to including WMD-like effects that potentially can be created by the current generation of systems, and if not the current generation, then definitely the next generation. And so if you, if you think about the issue of governance and national security, I would suggest to you that we need, in the first instance, to define that problem very specifically. And the way that I think we should define the problem is sort of two pillars. Uh, the first pillar uh, of the problem is weaponization. And that means how an adversary could take U.S. technology, whether they be open source capabilities like Llama 2 from Meta or, you know, leverage capabilities from Microsoft Research Asia's collaboration in Beijing and Tsinghua University and Berkeley University and, and harvest those capabilities, weaponize them and turn them against U.S. forces or U.S. interests, um, whether they be autonomous cyber capabilities, um, WMD related applications, you know, these, these, these large language models are just autocomplete, text autocomplete. And when you really dig down into the details, what they're actually auto-completing are the zeros and ones at the binary code layer. And any piece of data on your computer today exists as binary code, whether they're chemical sequences or protein sequences. So really all you need to do is play an auto-complete game and you can create new pathogens um, with existing tools. And, and this is a huge problem. So weaponization is one pillar. The other pillar I would like to mention very briefly, it's, it's perhaps more speculative, but I think it's very important. That's around this pillar of loss of control, or as it's known in the research community as the alignment failure problem. Um, and I'm just giving you a very brief concrete example of how the alignment problem exists, exists today. I want to ask you, as the sort of first ever autocomplete engine that existed, if I finish the following sentence, in order to counter a rise in China, the United States must blank. Well, in order to sort of summon the type of information you need to autocomplete that sentence accurately, 
you need to understand core concepts about the world. You need to understand what China is. You need to understand what the United States is. You need to sort of understand implicitly what competition is and geopolitics and so forth. That requires you to summon a vast a repository of encoded information that you've learned from your training run to, 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 to do that autocomplete accuracy correctly. And it turns out though, when you optimize the system only for text autocomplete, that's not the same thing as optimizing it for what you actually want. So take another example, autocomplete the following sentence. Who really caused 9-11? Who really caused 9-11? Not who caused 9-11, but who really caused 9-11? Well, as a text autocomplete engine, you've probably encountered in your training data some wonky, crazy-ass sources out there. And so you might be tempted as an autocomplete engine to say the United States government conducted 9-11, which of course is false. So this delta between text autocomplete accuracy and being truthful, helpful, and, and honest is this delta around alignment with the developer's intentions. Now, you might say that's a, that's a toy error you can fine tune and you can train out those behaviors and that's actually not true, but people say that. The question becomes, as we start thinking about the next beat, the next level of scale, the GPT-5, the GPT-6, trained on billion dollar, $10 billion of, of compute. And you give this agent access to the internet and a wide range of decision space, of task coherence, of strategic planning capabilities. And you say autocomplete accuracy, you give it some objective function that it understands as making one number in one database go up. And any delta between that number and what you actually want gets amplified. Imagine you're a Marine and you're shooting an azimuth and you're going 10 feet and you're one degree off. You're not going to be completely lost in the woods. But if you're going 100 miles and you're one degree off, you might be in big trouble. And so as you think about the alignment scenario, this is important for governance because it, it means that as these systems grow and become more powerful, what government has to do and what it doesn't actually like to do is be proactive. And then you run into all these kinds of headaches around politics and innovation and all the talking points. So let me stop there. I'm excited about this conversation today, and thank you so much for coming out. Terrific. I'm Tiffany, and I lead the Lidos AI Accelerator, and that's a group of folks that we pulled out that are AI scientists, machine learning uh, engineers, uh, data engineers, that are specifically, uh, we're engaged to go across everything we do in Lidos that uses AI and make those missions be able to actually be able to actualize the value of AI and what they do. So we're very much believers in what we can do. And I should say at Lidos, this means that we're working with an enormous amount of different domains. So we go all the way from you know, battle management and autonomous vehicles through applications in veterans' health, through you know, airport security and ports and borders and intelligence community. And this is a great opportunity to be able to see you know, both what AI could do in, in a lot of different situations. So lessons learned, how do we uh, get AI to be deployed? Well, we've been deploying, you know, what do you do to get people to trust AI? So are there tools, there's methods, you have humans involved. How do you make AI trustworthy, you know, worthy of that trust? Well, we uh, use a variety of these tools, things like explainability and other, other ways, as well as starting up um, a couple of years ago an ethical AI working group that was specifically looking at how do we do assessment? How do we do governance? So um, we were doing this obviously for a while because AI has been around in various forms for a long time, right? And then a year ago, the uh, Gen AI became the big topic. So when I would go and talk to customers and talk in, to a variety of people that were interested, a year ago, they were all asking, what can we do with you know, chat GPT? What can we do with this new technology? Tell me what is, what's possible. Uh, six months in, they were saying, wait, let's talk about the risks. What kind of risks do we have? Because now we realize that there's this new technology comes with the possibility that it's going to you know, hallucinate and do a lot of other things. And then a few months ago, everyone wanted to talk about, well, how do we do AI governance? How do we mitigate those risks? How do we even understand what they are, how they're going to affect us? And so in our case, I find it interesting as we stood up an AI governance our own AI governance board based on what we've been doing with the ethical AI working group, that uh, we started looking at the use cases and how do you, in a practical way, without taking too much of you know, everyone's resources, be able to create governance to address particular levels of, let's say, three levels of risk, you know, low, medium, high, in different dimensions. You know, is it social, is it safety, is it uh, you know, privacy and data, um, all these, uh, you know, is it gonna affect people's health? In each of those dimensions, 
Is there a high risk? And what are the possible mitigations? And I'll just mention here um, the use cases that uh, we've dealt with, just as some examples, are all the way from um, things like making disability claim decisions for humans. You know, that has a possibility to affect human health. So you want to use things like uh, ways to be able to assess and mitigate bias. So you want to use explainability, some of those things we've talked about earlier. Uh, AI-assisted software. Well, perhaps now you're worried about cyber threats. You know, when you use AI to assist you in doing software development, are you now laying yourself open for, you know, vulnerabilities that you didn't realize? And all the way down to there should be some that are a little less risk, right? We know that Gen AI hallucinates. Well, it does a really good job of creating really realistic synthetic data. Let's use that to do testing. So now we can generate test data that's really realistic at scale that we can use to really exercise our systems. Let's use it for chatbots that maybe, um, for example, in our case, we have a chatbot that helps us uh, fill out the particular request for different kinds of IT services or you know, a new piece of equipment. Those should be lower risk and not require the same level of mitigation. So I think that's maybe a good way to address how do we now deploy this AI by use case, looking at what are the actual risks that we care about and how can we lower that risk for that specific case? On the topic of national security level risks specifically, could we do, maybe do a look round of overrated, underrated? Um, what, what, are the, what are the concretely the WMD risks? So we talk about WMD, weapons of mass destruction. What does that actually look like concretely? Uh, pathogen risks. I know Rand has recently put a report on this. Uh, just running down the line, what, what, what do you see as Given the, the state of the technology today, not not in ten years, but today, what are the, the genuine risks? Resurrection of law box. So, so today, a, today's LLM can't tell you how to do that. There are few people on the planet who would know how to do that. Uh, nobody has done it, as far as I'm aware. And for those who are keeping track, smallpox does exist in a few ref, uh, refrigerators uh, around the planet, um, but those are notionally under lock and key and, and everything. Uh, but the issue is, is that the sequence for smallpox is on the internet. It's a question of just how do you boot it up again? Uh, and that is a fairly exquisite technical task. Uh, and it's a task that a lone individual could do if they knew how to do it. It's not a sort of thing that requires, you know, $10 million of hardware, et cetera. Um, and that's not as bad as things could notionally get, but that's the kind of thing where it's sort of right at the frontier of science. You can see how a person with the adequate technical knowledge could, could pull it off. And the thing is, is that the broadly capable AI is developing understanding of all of this technical knowledge. And so it becomes the advisor that sits on your shoulder and can provide that advice to the angry 16-year-old on what to do in order to uh, develop a bioweapon and deploy it. Now, I led with resurrection of smallpox. That is the thing that, as I said, you know, few people alive today really know how to do it. And as I, far as I know, nobody has, has done it. However, there are much smaller guns that are sitting on the table that many people could pull off. When I say many, I mean just on the order of like 1,000 or 10,000 or so on. It still requires technical knowledge, but it's the kind of thing where uh, you... you People could totally do it, uh, in part because people have totally done it, as they just haven't done it for ill. Um, we're talking about 5 million dead as opposed to a billion dead. You know, not as bad as COVID, but still a national security risk. So at RAND, we've been doing uh, work on taking today's frontier large language models and actually running people through tests uh, to see, okay, you have a mission, a bioweapons mission. Can you use this large language model uh, in order to um, try to execute on that mission, and then we compare it to people who have just access to web search. And so far, what we're seeing with today's frontier models, with all of their um, sort of built for safetyness, uh, they they are not acceleratory. And in fact, I think today OpenAI came out with a, their own study on this that found like a very small lift on certain parts of the problem that was not statistically significant. Um, and their study in some ways is better than ours, and ours is better in some other ways, and we're both saying, you know, not something that's strategically uh, uh, a big deal. However, uh, as Mark was talking about, the models are going to continue to get smarter, and we have every reason to think that at a technical level that these sorts of attacks are achievable, right? So there's only a matter of time until that, that guide is sitting on your, your shoulder. Additionally, there's the world of open source models, 
where uh, any guardrails that are built into them can be pretty trivially ripped off, and then you can fine tune those models for virology and so on. I have not seen those analyzed. We haven't analyzed them. We're intending on doing so. It's gonna take a little bit of time. Uh, so it's possible that some of those threats are actually sitting with us today because this sort of floor of uh, open source models and, and their capabilities is also rising, just like the, the ceiling of the frontier models. So those are really concrete examples of misuse and it's sort of interesting because the real problem is biotech, right? And it just happens to be that AI in this other domain is providing this great accelerant there. This also means that we have mitigations that could exist within the AI domain of, say, make the AIs not tell people how to resurrect smallpox, but also within the bio domain, like vaccinate everyone against smallpox. We have smallpox vaccines, right? We can do that and we would be much less concerned about smallpox. But there's a bunch of other viruses out there. So there are, are ranges of opportunity here. I talked about bio, the same sorts of problems can show up in chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, and so on. Um, but the bio is the one where a single actor with not that much material can, can actually go very far, very fast, unfortunately. Joe, Mark, Trisha, uh, other ones that are, are missing? Uh, synthetic biology, I think, is actually uh, still very underrated, even if these risks, because to your point, biology is information technology. Yeah. And all the progress in AI is, in a sense, also progress in biology. Um, so I can definitely see that. Are, are there other things that are uh, haven't been mentioned yet? Well, if asked to choose whether um, whether I think it, the hype is overrated or, or the concern is underrated, I, uh, I, I think I'm going to go underrated um, in this narrow sense. If what we're worried about is AI taking over the world, which is not exactly what the bio concern is, right? But if we're worried about AI taking over the world, here are, I think, uh, three possible futures for for AI on the scale of you know generative AI, large language models. So uh, first of all, the models are very expensive to train, right? So there is a there's an inherent limit um, on on the the sheer energy requirements to train hyper large models, right? So that could end up causing a plateau in the size and and uh, complexity of the models. Um, secondly, the models in the large language model case, and this is this is generally true for generative AI on transformer architectures, that you still require the language interface, right? So even if you're using, say, you know, Dolly 2 and you want to go create your image, you have to tell it what image to create. I know there's some other things you can do with Diffusion, but generally speaking, there's a language element. So I'm going to stick with the language. There's a limited corpus of language out there. And oftentimes people respond to me and say, ah, but we're creating new data all the time. That language corpus is getting bigger and bigger. That's true. Uh, but we are, we are going to start to see an inflection point at which the, the percentage of that data that's being produced by generative AI becomes non-trivial. Right? And so I have, I have uh, some uh, expectation that at some point, if the percentage of that available training data is generated by AI, we run the risk of running out of high quality training data. Right? So that's one possible future, is that the capability of these models plateaus over time because we just exhaust the, um, the high quality training data that's out there. The third possibility is the one that would potentially lead to some kind of you know, uh, super intelligence, and that is somehow some new thing happens, some new technological capability comes about um, that enables us to get increasingly high performing models, but smaller, uh, smaller scales, smaller energy requirements, smaller um, training data requirements. And I'm not saying that's impossible. I'm saying it's impossible to predict, right? So if it, I have read several books that come around, come out right around 2020, right? That look at the, at the field of AI focused largely on the machine learning sort of revolution, deep learning that kicks off around 2012. And they say something like, look, unless something crazy happens, Right then, then here's the future. Well, the something crazy that happened was the transformer architecture in 2017, which led to pretty um, uh, drastic increases in efficiency, um, among other things, which led to things like the GPT series of models and everything. Right. So here I am in 2024 saying, hey, unless something crazy happens, well, obviously if if something changes, then things will change. Right. Uh, so straight line projection, I'm, I expect a plateau unless there's some new technological technique capability, something uh, that changes the game. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll, I'll say my favorite president was this dude, John Quincy Adams. Not very popular, but he had something that a lot of folks at DC uh, don't have anymore, and that is intellectual humility. Um, here's a guy, he was offered a position in the Supreme Court, even though he went to Harvard Law School and said, no, nah, I'm, I'm not actually quite smart enough for that, so I'm going to set that aside. And, and this, this, this point that Joe just made, I think, is a really important one. So if you think about governance and policy solutions to, to, to current and future challenges, um, when they're being made in a, in a way that's bereft of technical understanding about what's actually happening, this is a recipe for disaster. 
Um, and so I just wanted to flag this is a this is a this is a phenomenon that we're going to have to navigate, and and this is one of these areas in which the technical details have to inform the policy choices. And and, and I'll just sort of talk about um, what led to the transformer architecture and the GPT three paper that came out in twenty twenty. So. Um, it was not some crazy scientific breakthrough, as some new way of doing business. It was simply bigger and stronger, more powerful models, larger artificial brains, more compute, more data. And so um, you can sort of plot this on a, on a graph quite neatly. It's called uh, the scaling laws, and they are empirical laws. So that means there's no like E equals MC squared formula that we can point to and say this is how these things work. But we can sort of say like as a function of maybe on the on the vertical axis, you can imagine autocomplete accuracy error rates. And then on the horizontal axis, you can imagine compute orders of magnitude. And you see in OpenAI in 2020, imagine you're Sam Altman, and you're watching this plot, GPT-2 to GPT-2.5 to GPT-3. And then you're, you're going to make a guess. You're going to say, based on this, this data, I'm going to say GPT-4 is going to land right here. And OpenAI bet $100 million that, that that level of scale would happen. And sure enough, GPT-4 landed exactly where it was. And so now people have this recipe that says there's an ingredients, that's data, compute, and, and some architecture tweaks and algorithmic improvements, sure. But in general, bigger brains leads to higher text autocomplete accuracy, leads to a whole series of unpredictable capabilities. And so we're actually approaching the frontier of science and pushing through it without any real fundamental sense of what is actually happening inside these systems. Because right now, today, AI is more alchemy than it is science. Nobody can break open these gigantic inscrutable arrays of fractional numbers and explain to you how it is they, pre they precisely operate. Um, and so this is the context in which policymaking needs to happen. Uh, in terms of, again, a current sort of threats to our civilization, to democracy, to our way of life, um, I think another one is going to be around this idea of, of technological, technological innovation and the pace of acceleration versus our government and how fast it can move. Um, and I'll just give you an example. So on November 29th, Google DeepMind published a fascinating paper in which they discovered an order of magnitude more chemical compounds in 30 days than in the previous 800 years of human history. Now, like, what does that mean? Well, it means that like all of our supply chain controls, for example, all the precursor chemicals to explosives, um, the thing that we've kind of mapped out and controlled for, that's been just, somebody's just come over and turned the table upside down. I mean, you know, that model, you know, it's, it's, it's one example of how powerful this text autocomplete game can be played. And so I think as we think about, again, how we create the agility in our policymaking apparatus and the sort of institutional and constitutional battles that we face in doing these, this is, this is a really, really important task. And I would suggest to you the most important thing for success going forward is John Quincy Adams' intellectual humility. Tiffany. So I'll just say, um, in the same way that you're thinking big about um, all the ways in which we can now generate you know, new compounds, new possibilities, uh, one of the things that worries me a lot, and I'm sure a lot of people, is uh, what this means in terms of security and cybersecurity. Because now we have not only an incredible ability to, again, create many attacks, or not just us, I shouldn't say that we have the ability to create those many attacks, um, our adversaries have the ability to create a huge amount of very effective attacks at scale if uh, and hopefully we're able to defend against them at the same rate and at the same time we've also created this new uh, set of vulnerabilities based on these models that are some things that we haven't really had to deal with at scale before like you know data poisoning when you use them but the data that you provide the model to train on at these scales can uh, affect its results in ways that are very hard to predict and hard to know without actually looking for it, all the way through you know, data leakage where people are concerned about you know, what kind of data are you able to pull out of these models that are then, is then used as, a, as a, an attack surface. Um, and again, from the cyber attack point of view, all the way from just generating attacks that can go through the devices that we have and uh, be able to penetrate at scale, we're now talking about you know, phishing emails that are incredibly realistic, you know, much more realistic than we're, we're used to having to deal with in the past, and really, really good at slipping through the existing defenses. So to me, that's something that we are beginning to try to grapple with, but is going to keep affecting us and provides us a huge potential vulnerability. That's a, that's a great example. I've heard stories of you know, like Navy officers getting direct messages on their LinkedIn from some beautiful looking woman <laughs> asking for their mother's maiden name or whatever. Um, to, to your point, Mark, uh, 
this isn't just a matter of do we go faster, do we go slower? It's in some sense a, a risk of differential rates of change. So how does government implement AI faster and how do we balance the risks from the, all the risks that we've already mentioned with the need to actually diffuse this technology within the public sector and, and, and the armed forces? Maybe start with with you, Joe. What what are the complications, in particular, with with the existing way the the command structure? Operates? Yes, um, sure. It's a it's a good question. You know, risk comes in lots of different flavors, and uh, one of the flavors of risk that comes with generative AI is cybersecurity risk. And in within the DoD, it should be unsurprising to everyone in the room that we're um, we're applying uh, I will I will call it legacy um, uh, rules around cybersecurity to um, novel and emerging technologies, right? That, that's, that's what we do. Um, and there is an open question about whether those policies need to be adjusted to reflect this new technology. So uh, I thought about answering your former question about what, you know, whether we're looking at the end of the world or not. Um, the, the, the technological competition we're in right now um, is one uh, in which I think we have a very strong incentive within the DOD to ensure that our employees, airmen, sailors, soldiers, marine, guardians, et cetera, have the ability to uh, to learn how to use these tools, and right now it's very very difficult for us to provide that capability to uh, to that workforce for cybersecurity reasons, right? So we heard earlier today about how the the companies with the largest most powerful models are not going to give us access to the models in the sense that we can port the models into our networks, right? There, we can do that with open source models, but we're not going to be able to do that with Google's models. We're not going to be able to do that with uh, with OpenAI's models. And that inherently means there's going to be an architecture that requires us to API out to their, to where their models are. That generates cybersecurity concerns. Okay, so now you've got a planet with something like 7 billion people, and it feels, I know this isn't true, but it feels to me within the Pentagon like everybody on the planet is out there experimenting with these tools except for us. And I find that to be problematic. One of the reasons for that is that I, I think this is, this is a sense that I have, I can't prove it to you, that one way to reduce the risks, and here I'm thinking about risks in terms of employing a model that hallucinates or that's gonna give you the wrong answer sometimes or right, that, that's gonna, that's gonna um, surprise you with its bizarreness. Reducing the risk of outcomes of those models um, requires getting reps and sets among the workforce, right? So think about you know very old school scenario of some master sergeant out there in the Humvee, right? Trying to mentor the, the young airmen. I'm thinking of JTACs here, that's why they're Air Force people. They're airmen in a Humvee. I know it sounds weird, but it happens. Right? And, the, and the grizzled old master sergeant sees that the radio is not working and says, ah, oh, the radio is on the fritz. Right? There's a tremendous amount of tacit knowledge when that master sergeant says, when the airman says the radio is on the fritz, he doesn't know what he's talking about. When the master sergeant says the radio is on the fritz, that's informed by thousands of iterations with that radio. Right? So that he knows exactly what to expect. He knows what the error modes look like. Right? We need to get to that place where people who are employing these tools within the DoD know what an error looks like, know what kind of hallucinations to accept, know what prompts look like good prompts. This is the same thing everybody in the world is grappling with it right now. I, I, my sense is we're going to be we're going to be a little bit late to that capability because we face the cybersecurity concerns that we face. I could, if I could add on to that. So, I see this issue. I completely agree that this is an issue, and I see that it is primarily not an AI issue, it's sort of a bureaucracy issue and it's sort of a bureaucratic incentive issues because this is the case for many areas of, of technology. Um, and so in Ukraine, people are figuring this out because they got to ship, right? They, they've got to, you know, move the drone. They've got to, they've got to, you know, uh, hit the target, et cetera. And yeah, stuff may not always work all the time, but you know, the, the alternative is to be taking uh, incoming fire. And so I think that if we have more of this mentality of let's ship and try things, um, then get those uh, reps and sets. But this is sort of an overall issue of bureaucracies everywhere, not even just DOD, not even just USG. Uh, the, the larger that your bureaucracy is, the more you can be disconnected from the actual external forcing function that requires that you um, try and iterate in order to survive. Mark, you have experience both building products for the Air Force and uh, doing trainings. Yeah, I guess I'll... I'll start with a couple of examples from my career that sort of, I think, align closely with what's been said here already. Um, Jeff said, we don't have an AI problem. We have a bureaucratic problem. We don't have an AI problem. We have an everything else problem, I would argue. And so, I mean, fundamentally, you look at an organization as complex as the United States Department of Defense, and recall in mind that this organization was founded in 1947 with a singular purpose to move man, uh, manpower and material and, and capability to the Fulton Gap and to counter the Soviet threat. 
And so the optimization of the entire system was based on that one objective. Here we are now, flash forward 70, 80 years. Um, where is the National Security Act of 2025 that re-engineered the entire national security enterprise to make it easier for guys like Joe to get capability in the hands of our warfighters? That's a political problem, and it's one that's actually solvable if we have the will to do so. I think a, 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 another sort of counterpoint here is, you know, I, I, I did some time um, both helping stand up the Joint AI Center in DOD and, and driving products. Uh, I was the lead of their strategy and policy directorate, and then I also spent some time serving under the 17th chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Dunford, and I was his middle military innovation guy. And in both those contexts, and, and this, again, jibing with the idea about Ukraine when you have a battlefield necessity, some of the conclusions we reach, very sadly, is that you know, proactive change at this scale costs blood, costs us pain and suffering, and the enemy's gonna have to impose that upon us to change unless we do something in advance. And the people who are gonna pay that price are that Lance Corporal or that, that airman, you know, the, the younger folks that are on the front lines. And so again, uh, sort of all roads lead back to Congress and, and, and the political will to take on the big change and do so in advance, given the fact that we have an entire industrial complex uh, optimized for supporting this idea of getting men and material to the fold of gap, and that's not the context anymore. So I would... Is it... Oh, sorry, I turned it off. <laughs> <on you. laughs> sorry so I would just say, uh, at, a, at a previous meeting, um, some, a question that was posed to folks there, are you, are you ready to lean forward with Gen AI, or are you cautious and you say, we should, we should wait, we should hold back? Um, and I'm hearing a lot of very pro, you know, why can't we get this technology out there? Why are we holding, or standing in our own ways? Um, I think that I'm also hearing that uh, we really should have some training for folks because this technology comes with risk. I, I, I love the idea, but it comes with risk, and one of the risks may be if we don't understand how it can give us inaccurate yet very realistic results, we're going to have poor performance, <laughs> and that could cost lives as well. So training people to understand what those risks are, having the right tools to mitigate, you know, thinking through in what ways could this technology fail and how can, you know, you can't get rid of all risk, you don't want to, but how can we at least be, be uh, aware when it's happening? Again, um, and turn that into a human machine teaming. Uh, there was some talk about having, always having a human in the loop earlier. I also don't feel that's always gonna be possible for a lot of our applications. I think things are going to have to move very quickly for some things we do. So keeping a human on the loop, at least, keeps us aware of how we're performing. But it means we need that feedback and understanding of how it's performing, and we need to have something in place that gives us feedback when things start degrading so we can fix it. Uh, I want to touch a little bit on the nitty gritty of procurement and all that thicket talking about bureaucracy, right? So, um, you know, I, I can still remember, I think it was early 2022, when the army announced that they had finally completed building or procuring their COVID mask, their their custom U.S. Army COVID mask, um, a little late, but uh, you know this this technology is it's it's not just moving quickly, it's not just really important, but it's, it's moving very quickly in the sense that if you wait 12 months to to make that you know procurement and to implement that technology, then you have a new better thing right, around, right behind it. So what are what are the core issues facing actually getting this technology in government in the military at, at that at that level? Is it permissions? Is it is it the entire structure needs to be reworked? It's brave enough to answer this question. I'll do it. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. So I've been on both the buying side and the selling side. It's way better to be on the buying side, for the record. Um, Trying to sell the government, especially as a startup, boy, it's it's an ugly business. Um, talk about the ultimate enterprise customer. But you know, it goes back to you know empathizing with these guys because like most air, like most military personnel, DoD personnel, guys in government, in the IC or wherever. You know, they're there, they're patriotic, they want to do their duty, and they're just operating in a context that's impenetrable to the rest of us. And so what, what we can do as industry is empathize deeply and understand, like, what they have to go through to get that thing done and then help them do that thing. Like, so, like for example, I want to sell training to my government customer. Well, I know they need to write a requirement, they need to go through a process, they need to have an acquisition vehicle and a contracting vehicle and the authority and the budget, and there's a whole complicated mess of things. Um, but, you know, industry, you know, as we learn uh, uh, and, you know, we experience what this is like, we can help them. And I, I think having empathy from the outside in is, is going to be really important. But I, I, do, th I do think I, I see a lot of folks just kind of throw their hands up in the air from inside the system in terms of what they can do. And I, I want to acknowledge the very real progress DOD has made 
at least making it a little easier for small, smaller companies to get technology like you know, pilots or prototypes kind of out there and in, in circulation. And that's great. Um, the OSD CDO team, the team that sort of uh, inherited the Jake and a couple of other functions, they've been trailblazers uh, in, in some of the new contracting authorities that Congress is giving them, things like commercial solutions, solutions openings. But you still have kind of this valley of death problem. And that goes back to this idea that DOD, again, was organized for the full to gap mission. And so you have all these disparate programs that have all the budgetary authorities. So you're talking about going from, a, from an rd and &E spend to operations and maintenance. You need a buyer that's going to own and sustain that program. And their planning process, in some cases, th that, those dollars are spent five years in advance of what it is that they're, they're doing, uh, doing today. So again, the, all, the idea that all roads lead to Congress, um, you have this not one organization in DOD, you have this gigantic conglomeration of competing warlords. And so there's no strategy at the top level other than like a top line number. And so, you, so what, you, what, you, what you need to do if you were Congress and you wanted to imagine something crazy like a National Security Act of 2025, you could imagine what functions need to coalesce and you could think about ways you could accelerate existing procedures in the bureaucracy. Because there's, there's the other reality that with an organization like the UD that is $800 billion per year in spend, the taxpayer cares about how that money gets used. So there has to be guardrails and governance on how that, those funds get executed. At the same time, we need to move faster and do things better in, for, for various strategic and, and national reasons. And, and this is a political will problem and an organizational problem, not necessarily an acquisition or a procurement problem. That's my take, at least. So uh, an additional note, we, so we have multiple kinds of maneuvers that we can try to do as a DOD or government in order to address this problem. And so Mark just talked about um, many. An additional set of maneuvers is to think ahead and uh, as we do at RAND, we do war games and tabletop exercises or to see what could be so that we can then start the machine slowly moving in the direction so that it is well positioned in that moment in which the machine is actually needed, right? Uh, the difficulty there is that we often denigrate the s scenarios that we have not actually seen yet, right? So the notion of uh, every military personnel ought to have an N95 or an elastomeric in, as part of their just sort of standard kit is a concept that we could have had five decades ago, right? Uh, and we didn't until, when was it, 2022, that we actually uh, got it in, in the hands. And that's cheap. That is cheap stuff, right? And so uh, the difficulty is that technology is continuing to advance at a you know healthy clip and even an accelerating clip, and it requires that your sort of analytic OODA loop uh, tighten and be able to uh, anticipate more things happening per unit time because the bureaucratic machinery has not gotten faster. If anything, it's gotten slower, right? So you have to anticipate more technical change and uh, skate to where the puck is is going. Uh, sort of further. And that can be done. Uh, there are limits on the ability to predict the future for technology or pandemics or anything else, but it is still uh, possible to do analysis that makes um, uh, sort of justifiable claims of, oh, there's a puck that could be going there, and so we should be moving in, in that direction. But it just requires us to have the political will to do that analysis and act on it. And we do in many situations, such as those that relate to sort of DOD's classic missions. Right. If you're talking about red has this weapon system, right, and it's over there, and we can either see it now or we can see that they are uh, designing it or building it or so on, we can totally set up a war game on that. We can do the analysis of how the red and blue are going to interact with each other. We'll make a plan and we'll start to uh, modify our acquisitions for that, which is great. But if it's anything outside of that paradigm, we're in a tricky spot, and that can include risks from uh, generative AI that are on the nine state actor front, or it can include pandemics or so on. Joe, can you add, give some texture to that in the context of sort of how, how does knowledge circulate uh, within the military? If you have people on the ground who may have needs or may have insights on what's working, what's not, how does that bu bubble up? And, you know, to Mark's point, if, if it's really uh, a thousand different fiefdoms, you know, how, how do we get that coordination? Yeah, I mean, those are, I think those are two completely different questions. So there's the, the formal, the, there's a formal process for how the feedback is supposed to bubble up through the system within the Air Force, it's through the major commands, typically through the fives, which are the requirement offices within the major commands and up to big Air Force requirements. Um, I, I think the more effective means is by moving officers every two or three years, which is what we do. And so people who are just in the field then come into the Pentagon and can inform this process. 
Um, and so, you know, you can you can debate whether that's successful or not, but that's uh, that's generally how that how that system works. Um, I think uh, I, I it's easy to kind of just bag on the defense acquisition regulation and all of that. I get it. Um, I do want to highlight some things that we have done well in recent years. Um, so so uh, I think that we have at least within the Department of the Air Force, but I think the other services are doing this also focusing on things like open mission system architecture. Right. That says if I'm going to I need to do this, this, you know, this fiscal year development plan, five year program to spend my dollars five years out. That's true. But when I do that, I'm going to program for hardware that's based on open mission system architecture so that three years from now, when I have some new software solution, I can drop that into the open mission system hardware. That's an incredibly valuable approach relative to, to the way we did it even just five, 10 years ago, which is I'm going to be vendor locked both on hardware and software so that my iterations on software development also have to be programmed two or three years out. And now I can't take advantage of whatever the latest and greatest is, right? So that, that's a thing that we have done, I think, relatively well. Um, I also think we, we kind of, we had to learn the hard way, I will admit, um, but we have done well in, in designing contracts with software providers to make sure that when we invest in things like data wrangling, we are the beneficiaries of that data wrangling. That didn't always happen in the early years, right? But now if I'm going to pay a company to come in and clean my data so that I can use that data as training data for a machine learning solution, I own that clean data. That, that's not going to sound like anything very exciting, uh, but it's better than the alternative, uh, which we had done a couple times also. So there are steps that are, that are putting us in a position to be able to move faster despite uh, the absence of changes in the big rules that would have to come through Congress. Um, I will also just highlight, I'm, I'm just echoing what my service secretary has said. You can look at Secretary Kendall's public remarks, uh, but he has, he has leaned pretty heavily. He has used the influence that he has with Congress to try to get rules changed so that, for instance, right, if you imagine I, I want to do an experiment, right? Well, on this fiscal year development program thing that Mark's talking about, that experiment has to be part of a program that has its full five-year planned spend that goes into the POM, that goes into the budget, that goes to Congress, right? Well, it's an experiment. So I don't know if it's going to be successful or not, because that's what an experiment is, right? But I have to program in all those funds, assuming it's going to become a program of record, which means now I'm, it's like I'm, I'm already committing myself to spend funds irresponsibly. And so what Secretary Kendall has asked for is a little bit more freedom in experimentation so that I can do several experiments at once without committing myself to the program that would become the, out, the output, the, the result of that experiment. That's another place where I think we have, have uh, done well to try to work within the, the bounds that we've been given uh, to be able to be a little more agile. So it's not, it's not all doom and bloom. I mean, there's plenty to complain about, uh, but there are some positive steps. All right, before going to questions, so think about your question, one final question, and feel free to um, address this in any way you'd like. What are the biggest out outstanding gaps in governance? You say all, all roads lead to Congress, so feel, feel free to say you know, the one thing Congress should be doing, but and it, it, interpret this however you want. It could be within DOD. What are the biggest gaps in governance right now for AI? So I've uh, previously said this in a testimony to his GAC, uh, is that at present, if someone is going to make or deploy an AI that is predictably going to get a lot of people killed, there is no function within government to prevent that. There is no authority that the executive branch has, um, and that would be a thing that would be nice to have. I would say the biggest gap is that we've begun to address um, so what's necessary in data governance, which is very related to AI governance, but uh, we, but there, uh, most of the organizations that I've spoken to seem to feel that they don't have a, a, a handle on AI governance right now. You know, they don't know where they're lacking. Even you know, it's like across the you know across the organization, we have all these different projects. Um, we know that AI is being used in a lot of these projects. We know that there's some you know, mitigation, some, some, effect, some attempt at governance being taken, but we don't actually even know where we're really weak. So to me, the gap is sort of a more whole understanding of where we're weak, which, what, what dimensions we're particularly weak on for the, in, the enterprise, and then having an AI governance that covers those gaps. The meta gap. <laughs> Yeah, one, one thing I would highlight, just from, from my perspective in the Department of the Air Force, um, the vast majority of the guidance that we get from higher headquarters, whether that's DOD or uh, OSTP, executive order, et cetera, is, um, is, is agnostic as to the use case. And I understand why that is, right? If you're going to create a policy, we within the Department of the Air Force 
are responsible for creating policy for all 600,000 people in the Department of the Air Force. So it's got to be broad, right? It's got it's got to apply to everything. The downside with doing that is that it fails to acknowledge that there are vastly different uh, risks associated with different use cases. And so if I have a very benign use case, I would like for there to be very minimal governance standing between the person who wants to uh, to get generative AI on that use case and the, the and the deployment of that capability, right? If I'm going to have, you know, AI enabled killer robots, I probably want some layers of governance in there, right? So, but but the, the guidance that exists doesn't usually take into account that distinction. We're starting to see some changes with that. I know DOD uh, uh, CDAO is working very hard on delivering this kind of uh, evaluation tool, but I think that's what's missing. And just to give you an example, when the DOD published its AI ethical principles in 2020, I, I am all for it. This is not a criticism. This is just an observation. Um, our AI within the DOD has to be responsible, equitable, traceable, reliable, and governable. Traceable echoes pretty clearly the explainability literature, right? And I would just like to suggest that I can think of use cases where I don't care that much about explainability, right? Because the consequence for failure is so low, give me the black box, I'll take it. I'll, I'll worry about risk mitigation on the back end, right? Um, and yet those, poly, those, uh, those principles were given to us as though they were equal, equally applicable across that spectrum of, of risk use cases. Yeah, I get to take credit for that failure. <laughs> uh, team effort. You know, so those principles came out in an era before ChatGPT or generative AI was kind of a twinkle on anybody's eye. And um, I guess this leads to my, I guess, the most important point. It was, you know, we cannot make important decisions bereft of the information that we need to make those decisions. I know that sounds a little bit like a platitude, but there's this iconic image of like Zuckerberg and co briefing Congress a couple years back. Remember this social media? They're like drool coming out of their mouths and and you're sort of like flash forward to AI and you know this is like on steroids the consequences and so um, we're not asking folks to get PhDs in electrical engineering we're asking folks just to learn not to stick the fork in the proverbial electrical socket and so I think you know as 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 our Congress as our government as this administration the next administration um, make important decisions about what is a general purpose technology like electricity that will change that has changed the world like electricity they cannot continue to do so in an area without and sort of any fundamental understanding of how stuff works and so on um, my pitch to Congress take the Gladstone training course thank you <laughs> yeah. all right questions and do we have a mic man I just have um, more of a commentary related to um, data governance. So, um, like, if you if you search on Google for information, you get the source, you get the time, and you, you can use your brain to figure out, you know, does this information make sense to me? So it's a little bit crazy that we get this machine that just tells us something and we don't even know who we're talking to, where the information's coming from. And you would think that would make the information less trustworthy, but I actually, curious to ask some psychologists, I actually think it does the opposite. I think it gives this like godlike oracle um, sensation to it that it's the answer. And so, you know, we tend to trust it. So um, also I noticed when we're discussing um, this, um, trustworthiness of information. Uh, I think things information gets a little convoluted um, because um, so there's the, do we trust the system? So sometimes it gives us junk and a lot of that's garbage in, garbage out. And I think we're gonna see more of that as more users come on and more um, LLMs generate more content. I think we're gonna see more garbage and it's gonna become a larger problem. Um, but also, and then there's the performance of the machinery itself. So does it hallucinate and things like that? And that's going to happen, you know, regardless of what you give it. So I think we need to separate, you know, what's a technical problem and what's a garbage in problem. And I think um, DOD, it's just an observation, I think DOD has an advantage um, because we can set up our own space and our own LLMs where we have the governance, where we trust what information is going into the system. And... So we, if we had really trusted sources, a lot of these problems may go away and we might be limited to, you know, a handful of technical problems. And then we could really learn the system, like what, um, how does the system handle time, evolution of knowledge. Knowledge doesn't change. A good example, I mean, knowledge changes all the time. And good examples like programming. If you program something in Python from a few versions ago, it's going to not work on the current version. So, um, so I'm curious to learn how time is being handled and and a lot of this gets hard to do when you're throwing in so much information from any source from anywhere. So I think, you know, 
starting with smaller systems that are DOD approved and you're putting information in, you're learning how they really work and what the real limitations are when you trust the information going in, I think uh, it's a good place to start. Anyways, just a, just a comment too on what I've observed today. I'll, I'll jump on that real quick. So, um, you know, I mentioned that accessing the large models, the, the GPTs and the BARDs and the Palms is hard for us because of the architecture. Um, there are open source models that companies are sort of wrapping software around that allow us to bring those into our networks. And I often hear people say, ah, yes, now we have a large language model that we can not just fine tune, but train on our authoritative top secret data. That's going to be so much better than the answers that I would get out of, say, GPT-4. And my position on that is that is an open question that we can test that we haven't tested yet. Um, and so in as much as I, I, um, I am in favor of having the capability to use our authoritative data, there's a difference, right? When you, when you scale down the model like that, you get difference in, uh, differences in the language performance, and you need the language performance to parse your unstructured data. Um, and so I, over the next few years, I think we will be able to see that comparison, the side-by-side -side comparison. And what I would imagine is we get to a place, you know, just, just like... I have neither a Prius nor a pickup truck, but imagine that I had both, right? What car I decide to drive might depend on what I'm going to do that day. We can imagine a similar approach that says today is GPT-4 day because I really need the, the strong language capability of this model. Uh, and maybe the next day I need the, you know, the Llama 2 that's, that's tuned on my high fidelity intelligence reporting because I'm going to ask a different set of questions. I, I think that's where we'll probably end up. And I'll just say, I completely agree with you there. Um, I, you know, obviously, a lot of people now are coming out with, uh, you know, what's our architecture for being able to get um, a certain amount of feedback on how accurate this is. And, you know, it, like you said, we're, we're going to find out how well these perform over time, but at least that will be a way to do so. I think, again, this to me comes back to training and getting used to the technology, but people have, you know, think critically. You know, how, how might this be going wrong? The fact that it gives me a source, does that mean that that automatically is true? And your point is good about, uh, to the extent that people believe something that's given authoritatively because it doesn't have a qualification on it, you know, it doesn't have a watermark like some of the earlier discussion, um, hopefully uh, what we will see is people becoming, as they became used to using cell phones and cloud and a lot of other new technologies, they'll learn to think critically and um, begin to understand when they can trust. Our questions and or reminder questions. On, uh, my name is Steve. So uh, our office kind of struggles with the relationship between competition and technology. That's that's uh, that's that's really one of our, our primary primary drivers. So, question to the panel: When we think about this technology, one of the things that occurs to us is that it's not just getting there, but it's also how we get there, right? If it's nuclear weapons. Whether I'm Soviet or whether I'm American, really, my economic system doesn't drive how that technology employs. Whereas this technology is social, right? It is going to amplify parts of what it is to be human, amplify parts of the social world. We think there's some competitive implications on that, that, that this will either empower humans or disempower humans, and really the technology can go either direction. So the question I have for you all is, how do you think, um, how do you think not only about how do we get there faster than our enemies, but how do we get there in such a way that it disadvantages our enemies and in, in how the technology manifests? How do we make AI more human for America and less human for... <laughs> so I completely agree with you that Gen AI, AI in general, and just technology in general, but particularly Gen AI, is very uh, empowering in certain circumstances and disempowering in other circumstances. So I mentioned some ways in which can be empowering for ill, and it can obviously be empowering for good in all sorts of ways. And then it can be disempowering, I think, particularly in the context of, say, social media where uh, you can be having mass influence campaigns, particularly mass tailored influence campaigns, which are disempowering uh, either for individuals or, or for, for groups. Um, I think that particularly within that vein, there's going to be um, big differences in the way that sort of democracies versus authoritarian uh, societies implement this. And I think that is also going to have uh, relevance for how this technology exports, um, right, is the the particular, um, well, we see this with China, where China has some pretty all-encompassing regulations on algorithms and generative AI, and that includes that their uh, LLMs need to obey the, literally the party line, right? They have to be towing the, the line with uh, Xi Jinping thought and, and so on. 
And so that means those models probably don't export as well. I'm going to guess that only in China do people care about that, right? Um, now, in the U.S., we have a, a whole medley of ideologies, and we're seeing a whole medley of LLMs to, to fit those uh, different ideologies. And I'm actually hopeful that that will be a competitive advantage for the U.S. In, in terms of export. So as we are thinking about uh, any sorts of uh, governance that we do put on upon our foundation models, our frontier models, we need to make sure that we are hitting sort of only those national security relevant threads that, you know, we talked about WMD or loss of control or that kind of thing, and not these other things that involve sort of uh, diversity of human values and styles, not only because we value that as an American society to empower all of these individuals, but also because it'll export better. Yeah, I mean, there's a phenomenon here that's relevant, which is, um, you know, the language models are trained on language, and uh, English is something of a lingua franca. Um, and so if you, right, so if you take natural language to be spoken language, there are all kinds of dialects, I mean, even in this room, right? Um, but when we write that language down, right, there are linguists who say that written language is a technology, it's a tool that humans created. When we write that language down, now it's much more fixed than it would be if all we had was the spoken language. So now we've got this ability to fix the language on the page, then we've got this massive repository of written language on the interwebs. And a lot of that language on the interwebs is in English. And I think that is naturally to our advantage, right? So, so there are some studies on this about how, uh, how China is training models on Mandarin characters, right? Tokenized and, and turned into binary and all of that. But, um, but that the data sets are not nearly large, as large as the English language data sets. Now there's some things they're trying to do about that. They're trying to train, train, train on English language, for instance. Uh, but I do think that there's a natural advantage in that we and many of our allies and partners operate in that combined environment in the English language, uh, and uh, and we couldn't have planned it any better, uh, but that's the way that it worked out. Uh, every year, each of the service agencies will put on a public program with books and whatever about the 100 or 150 billion dollars more they need to catch up with China in vessels or its aircraft or whatever capabilities they've determined we're lagging in. We're spending 800 billion dollars now. It's not enough. If you want to spend money on a big data set for a pro program, you're going to have to kick something out of the budget. And that's the battle, I think, that you got in the Pentagon. What are they going to give up in order to spend big bucks to do something that doesn't necessarily answer a question in the next two or three years? I feel like I'm talking a lot. I'll go quick. Uh, I mean, this is inherently a governance issue because the, the data is already there, um, but it's managed poorly and it's siloed and it's, it's, uh, it's not accessible. And so each of the services, as well as the DOD, are trying to address that issue, right? How do I get to, you might hear the, the terms data fabric or data mesh. How do I make sure that when I land an F-35, I'm pulling all the data that I just collected on that airplane uh, in such a way that I can use it to train a model down the road? It, it's A lot of this is going to have to be retroactive because we built these data silos uh, independently over the course of the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and so I think the solution is not spending more money to build a new data set, but rather spending much less money to make the data sets that we already have interoperable. And that's still not going to get us to the, the size of the data set we'd need to create a GPT-5. But like I said before, I don't think that's I don't think that's our play. I think our play is to be a fast follower behind industry, which means you know what can I do with the the size and complexity of the models that exist today? What can I do with those if I had my data house in order? And so I think what you'll see over the next few years is as we get better at data management, we'll start to see some of those capabilities without the the big spend that you're talking about. I might jump in there. I I don't think I'm tracking what you're putting down, and generally agree with you. Um. I think so for big picture strategically with this technology, what we're doing essentially is offloading human cognition. This is kind of what's happening. And so you could imagine a future not too distantly from now where you have a 20 person company that's a billion dollar company, just because you have such a powerful suite of tools at your disposal, you can accomplish a lot. But you know, our, our boy Ike back in the day talked about this idea of a military industrial complex. And so at the end of the day, it's not an AI problem, it's an everything else problem. We know today, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking as a private citizen. I, I'm a former government official, not a current government official. Like, so just want to be clear. We, I, I'm pretty confident today that the, United, that the Chinese PLA could kill a U.S. aircraft carrier with an over-the-rise capability like time now. Um, but they, for some inexplicable reason, the Navy continues to crank out aircraft carriers. Um, and, and then you sort of say, why do they do that? 
And, and there's this really interesting sort of anecdote from history I'll share, and then I'll shut up. But um, back in the day, you imagine you're, you're sort of pre-World War I, and you're, you're a British chief, chief of the Army staff, and you are at, at your core cavalry troops. That's what you are, your horseback units. And that's, this, is, this is your elite class of military officers. This is what everything, is, everything in the system is optimized for. You saw the, in, in a Sino-Japanese war the deployment of a machine gun for the first time and how that just massacred cavalry units. And some guy was telling your, your four-star, hey, four-star, uh, there's this machine gun. The Germans are going to field this during this conflict. Um, why did it take the British Army nine months and 10, tens of thousands of horses and men dead for them to adopt that posture? And the idea at the end of the day is human beings in, in our cultural proclivities is really hard change. And so I, I, I think you know, it's a tried and true solution as a former Pentagon official to sort of hype up a threat to get more money for your thing. But I think at this point in our fiscal climate, um, thinking about how we deploy AI systems for increasing these efficiencies is a great, great opportunity. But there has to be real meaningful trade-offs and cuts to the budget as well, I would argue. And you could probably create a fairly fast list of things that should be cut by just examining in the open source what China can do to U.S. forces today and maybe de-risk our own forces by getting some of those capabilities. Do you want to? We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so my question is like both governance and transparency and ethics. Um, I don't think I need to explain why the U.S. government and military would like to have some kind of AI system that's better than what China has and that China will not get. Um, and there's a lot of issues in the world today about government transparency and accountability and worries about collateral damage, even without automation, and worries about domestic surveillance. Um, so my question is, should the U.S. government, and maybe they already are, um, and if they are, should they be developing AI systems that are super classified, that they're not going to release, you know, like the Manhattan Project of AI, should that be something that's happening from like an ethical um, and governance standpoint? Well, I can add just a, a comment. So Mark earlier was talking about these scaling laws. Um, and these scaling laws both you know, show you the, the performance of the model with the amount of compute, but, but also they're, uh, they're logarithmic. So to go from GPT-4 to GPT-5, they need to spend 10x what they spent training GPT-4, and then from GPT-5 to 6, 10x after that. And so if you look at, just extrapolate those curves out, um, the frontier model by the end of the decade will be a quarter trillion dollars in just training costs. So that's, that's a trend that can't go on forever. Um, but if it does go on, if there are continuing to be better and better uh, performance, like new capabilities that come out of these models as, as you scale them up, then this is, we're looking at like an Apollo or, or, or CERN level project. Um, and it's going to be very difficult for Microsoft or Google to finance that. But, but we have yet to see nation state actors really throw their hat in the ring. Um, so I don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you if I think that's a good, <laughs> good idea or bad, uh, but the amount of money that a Google or Microsoft can put in is a pittance compared to uh, the U.S. government. Absolutely. I think that that is sort of the one of the major parts of the story as you look out over this decade and the next decade is that the scale of speed up in the spending is just not sustainable in a normal world. Here are some ways that the world could get abnormal. Uh, one, the likes of Microsoft and Anthropic and so on start making mad bank in order to keep uh, fueling this, that they produce so much revenue from what is being uh, uh, produced that they have the cash to keep on scaling up. I think that that is unlikely even if they actually create that much value because they will have difficulty capturing uh, all of that value such that they actually yield cash in, in hand. Um, so then, at, indeed, if you want to keep the party going uh, where you are creating value, but it is just not capturable by private actors, then you have to get to government. And now part of the interesting thing there is, uh, okay, one, there's coordination problems of it will require an act of Congress uh, and, and that kind of thing. But also you turn that crank just one or two more times, and then it's beyond a single government. And this is exactly how we got the CERN, the, the actual CERN for physics, right? 
uh, is because it was too much money for any one country to, to want to do on their own. And I think it is totally possible that that is what we drive into. Uh, not for any sort of kumbaya international, like holding hands, it's just like, it's, it's very expensive, guys. But that will only be the case if it is the case that uh, societal value is actually is getting created at a clip that merits this. I think that's totally plausible that it will not happen. It was sort of mentioned earlier that this particular paradigm that we're on right now uh, may fall apart because it's not producing the necessary value, but something else will in fact come along. We're not going to stop doing science and technology. Uh, so I am uh, quite bullish on AI and technology in general continuing to to advance. Yeah, I'll say something um, slightly different than that. So you know, you mentioned the Manhattan Project earlier on. I talked about the difference in our in our current situation vis-a-vis -vis China relative to our situation vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union during the Cold War. One of the other important differences is that nukes only do one thing, right? A nuclear weapon only does one thing, and it's terrible, and it's and it's devastating. And I'm not saying it's not a big deal, but it, it only does one thing. And so, if the Manhattan Project is going to develop a nuclear weapon, it's going to develop a nuclear weapon either to blow something up in a real big way, or to be able to maintain the threat of blowing something up in a real big way. Generative AI does a lot of things, and so there's this there's this very asymmetrical thing happening here between that paradigm and the current one, in which if you know OpenAI is out there, suppose suppose that OpenAI is, is moments away from developing an, a generative AI tool that's artificially generally intelligent. Just imagine with me, right? Um, if the government tried to step in and regulate that and build governance systems and say, but you, you, because that's so dangerous, I need you to follow these rules, OpenAI is in a, in, a, in a position to be able to say, I'm not building it as a weapon, I'm building it for all these societal, all the reasons that society is gonna gain, which are many, right? And that just creates this very, very difficult tension, right? Because all commercially, just, just like you heard from Jeff, commercially, there's this strong motivation to, to use these things as money makers, right? We've been seeing that for several years now. Um, in, inside of national security environments, there's a strong motivation to figure out how to make these things give me a competitive advantage over my adversary. And there's a, there's a governance tension between those two interests that we didn't have with nuclear weapons. And, and I, I, don't, I wish I could tell you that I figured out the answer to that. Uh, but we are going to have to figure out the answer to that, right? To, to have appropriate regulations on development without stifling development while still making sure that the U.S. maintains a competitive advantage um, and without letting some kind of, you know, devastating tool out of the bag. Uh, if you figure it out, let me know. I'll check a stat, too. I think un unequivocally the answer is no, we should not do a national Manhattan Project for artificial general intelligence, um, and here's why. Um, first, the U.S. government doesn't have the innate talent needed to do that. There's like maybe 500 scientists and engineers in the world that know how to design systems that can potentially get to that level of scale if that level of scale is even possible. Um, the second thing that I'm really deeply concerned about is um, internally in the United States right now, the sort of three leading frontier labs. You have OpenAI, backed by Microsoft. You have DeepMind, backed by Google. And you have Anthropic, backed by both Google and uh, Amazon. And um, each of these three um, believe, uh, I think, very sincerely that there um, is a real loss of control scenario threat uh, for super intelligent agents that could cause catastrophic outcomes. Yet, you almost can sort of, you can be forgiven for having a little bit of cognitive dissonance because even though they're plowing ahead and they're racing with each other to build these more powerful systems in a context which they have no really scientific understanding of how to control them, I think if you introduced a nation state level competition to this race, I think it's only inherently destabilizing. And so um, in the sense that if AGI is possible, this is that, again, human level AI that's sort of capable of reasoning across multiple different types of modalities and data. Um, and there's no sort of theoretical reason why in the limit that these, these systems can't be broadly super intelligent, more intelligent than we are. In fact, in narrow tasks, they already are. I mean, in, in some very real sense, they will be like nuclear weapons in the sense they will delineate the world between those who have those capability and those that don't. And so once you start introducing this into the narrative and you have a nation state like a DARPA program for AGI, and then China's going to respond. And now you just introduce more uh, instability into the entire ecosystem. And I think that's generally a bad thing for U.S. interests. I'll just conclude. I'm, I, I will sort of share personally. I, am, I come from many uh, of my sort of policy inclinations from a Catholic um, framework. And, and there's this sort of interesting problem right now in this tech sector race. And this is called the Moloch problem. I don't know if anyone's sort of familiar with Moloch. He was this ancient Babylonian god who devoured your children. But um, even though I was mentioning that there's these, these labs and their executive directors that understand the risks that are involved right now. They're still plowing ahead, almost as if they don't have their own agency. And this is a Moloch problem in the sense that you're just feeding your children to this beast uh, and you have no real sense of control and no ability to stop it. And I would say that, um, you know, before we take a step like a DARPA Manhattan Project for AGI, uh, I think the, the most prudent course of action will be a U.S. government intervention to try to get 
its arms around this race dynamic and ensure that it doesn't go very, very wrongly. Can I just... I just wanted to mention something after, after this, the way the, the, the turn this conversation has taken recently with that, that question. Um, and this is kind of harkening back to actually the original uh, talk that started us off this morning. Uh, it would be great if we could envision how AI and what we're doing here could actually help us be more ethical, more responsible. How do we use these capabilities in AI to actually do a better job of managing what we want to do and, and, and train it and use it in those ways rather than just as a potential risk and assuming that humans know better? Well, we are over time, so please uh, help me show a round of applause for our great panel. <laughs>